It's so great to gather together and uh, to worship the Lord as a body, as a believers. And uh, man, I, I just know that God's got a word for us today. He's got a word for me. He's got a word for you. How many are you excited to just gather in together? It's a privilege. It's an honor. Those of you online, welcome. We're glad that you're tuning in, jumping in with us from wherever it is that you're watching. Those of you in the house, thanks for coming out. If you have your Bibles, open up to 1 Kings chapter 18, 1 Kings chapter 18. We're going to be studying in just a moment this chapter. We're going to walk through uh, several verses there, and we're going to dive in and let God's Word speak truth to us. Here's what I do know. I do know that God is raising up believers. He's raising up people like you, like me, to be able to stand up for God no matter what's going on around us, and that would simply believe that the Lord is God, right? How many of you believe the Lord is God? You know, I, I think there is this conditional statement you find through life that if this is true, then this is the result. And oftentimes, you know, when we, when we say if we believe this, then the result is we behave like this. So it's if this, then the result is we behave like this. For instance, I'll show you what I'm talking about. If this is true, then the result is this. So if you think back to school, I'm about to take you to school today, all right? I know some of you are depressed about that. I'm gonna take you back to school. Math, math 101, you ready? If X equal five, then what is the result to this statement? X is less than or greater than 10, what is it? Less than, less than. some of you still confused, man, you don't know. <laughs> if X equals five, then X is less than 10. If this is true, then this is the result. Think about it like this. If the news tells us a hurricane is about to hit Houston, what do you do? Freak out, that's what you do. Man, we prepare the house, right? We go get water, we go get bread. Like we're doing everything, we're pulling stuff in the garage, like everything, like our focus is getting ready for that hurricane, right? Think about it like if there is peanut butter on the counter, I'm eating it. Like, that. if, then this is the result. Now, I'm an older generation, but I'm told this is the way that it is. So, I don't know about this one, but I'm going to see if you do. If something is very cutesy, and if something is very mindful, then it is very... Now, half of you didn't even know what happened. I definitely don't know what happened, but I do know this, that if this... Then I know this, and if the Lord is God, then I obey him fully. And if I believe the Lord is God, it changes my Monday through Saturday. If this is true, then it impacts this. If the Lord is God, I'll stand on his word even if I don't understand it all, right? If this is true and the Lord is God, then I live for him in the good times and the bad. If the Lord is God, then it impacts the way I trust him with my decisions and I trust him with my emotions. Sometimes, man, it's hard to trust God. And I just want to challenge you for just a little bit to take a step in this thing and say, you know what, if I truly believe that the Lord is God, then as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Not the way we feel, not the way our lusts and temptations drive us, but or where our emotions want to live, but I'm going to live according to his word. See, here's what you've got to realize. Small faith in your God can make a big difference in your world. If you will just begin to put your trust and your belief and your faith that the Lord is God, it's going to impact how you actually live your life. If this, then that. There was a man in 1 Kings chapter 18 who lived his life believing that the Lord was God. And if the Lord was God, it changed how he lived his life, the faith by which he lived his life. And even in circumstances that was beyond him or circumstances that, that even in a dark day like he lived, he understood and believed that the Lord is God. And so it changed how he obeyed God. Whatever God said, he stepped into. Whatever God asked of him, he actually moved forward in obedience. And so I want to give you some context to 1 Kings chapter 18 real quick before we dive in and study God's word. And uh, we find, we walk and stumble upon uh, Elijah in this chapter in a scenario in Israel where the northern kingdom of Israel had had 19 
straight evil kings. 19. I'm talking about one king after another turned their heart away from God and continued to just press into false gods and false beliefs. And so much so that, that there was 200 years in Israel, 200 years of evil rising up above God. And so not only did these evil kings lead the nation to believe this, but they actually turned the people's hearts of the nation and uh, allowed the people's hearts of the nation to turn away from God towards evil. And so they began to compromise and corruption rose up and scandal and murder and idolatry. And, and, and so we saw people even, uh, you know, uh, sacrifice their kids in the name of, of evil false gods. And, and they would commit gross acts in the name of these false gods. Well, at the end of the 19 kings, Okay, at the end of the 19 straight kings that had turned their back on God, there was a king by the name of Ahab. Everybody say Ahab. Ahab. And his wife Jezebel. You probably heard of her. Say Jezebel. Jezebel. Now, these guys were the worst of the worst. As a matter of fact, Scripture actually tells us in 1 Kings that the reign of Ahab and Jezebel was more evil than all the kings that had led up to them. So things weren't getting better. They were getting worse. And so King Ahab was an evil king. King Je uh, Jezebel, King Mistress Wife Jezebel, was uh, one of the most evil women to walk the earth at this point. And so Scripture shows us that evil and corruption had risen up, had risen up to the point that there needed to be something done. So you know what God did? God said, "Enough. I'm going to send a man who believes that the Lord is." God. So what did God do? He raised up this man named Elijah who simply believed that the Lord was God. And therefore, anything he asked, he stepped out in faith to believe for. And I just believe today that God is doing the same thing. He's raising a generation of students who would walk onto their campus and not live like their peers, but live separate and shine a light into a dark world. I just believe God's raising up a generation of young adults who will fight for and pray for revival, not for a service slot, but for the, their life and for their world and their generation. I believe God's raising up moms and dads who will say, as for me and my house, we believe the Lord is God and therefore we will serve the Lord. I just believe God's raising up business leaders and, and businessmen, businesswomen who will see, uh, you know what, we're men of God, we're women of God, and you know what we're gonna do? Man, we're gonna fight for a godly culture to exist in this nation. In other words, God is raising up men like Elijah in this day and age to combat what the enemy is, is stirring and beginning to do. And I think sometimes what happens is uh, God, we forget that God wants to use us, that God wants to fill us with faith so that our Monday through Saturday would make a difference in the world around us. But it's really easy to look at the evil in this world and to be scrolling on Instagram or something, scrolling through Facebook, scrolling through and just seeing all the evil, seeing all the belief and the culture that goes against God's word. And sometimes we're like, man, I don't know if there's any saving America. I don't know if there's any saving in this world. But here's what I want to tell you today, and I want to just spark some faith inside of you, is that God is not looking for someone to tell him why it can't happen. God is looking for someone to believe him that it can happen. Come on, where's your faith? Stir that faith up like Elijah who would step into a time like this that he did in 1 Kings and believe God to do a miracle and to bring about change and victory in the name of the Lord. So here we stumble upon uh, 1 Kings 18 and where we begin reading is in verse one of 1 Kings 18. So if you have your Bible open, we'll jump right into that. Uh, but I wanna let you know uh, that what had happened is there's been about three years of drought up to this point. The Lord kind of brought drought, which would destroy economy uh, because a lot of their economy was built around rain and water. And so God brought drought because for 200 years, this nation had turned their back on God. And uh, Elijah was a prophet. And so King Ahab and Jezebel, remember the evil king and King guess. And remember, they're, they're out there, uh, and, and they're hunting down God's prophet and God's people, trying to kill them all. And Elijah was one of God's prophets in this day, and God had filled him with faith. And watch what happens in verse 1 and 2 as we set up today's message and, and, and what God wants to speak to us today. After a long time, in verse 1, after a long time in the third year, what is the third year? 
wasn't the third year of creation. It was the third year of this drought of, of God turning his back because they had, they had gone and began to serve other gods. The word of the Lord came to Elijah. Watch what, watch what the word of God told Elijah. Go and present yourself to Ahab. Remember that evil king? Go and present yourself to Ahab. Now, that at first doesn't feel like a real big ask of God to be able to tell him to just go talk to someone, but you have to realize Ahab was hunting down God's prophets all over, killing God's people, and he was trying to kill Elijah. So in this moment, when God asks uh, uh, Elijah to go to Ahab, there had to be faith for uh, Elijah to actually step out and do what God's called him to do. He's about to go face to face with a guy that wants to kill him and who's king and has the power to kill him. And God says, if you do this, and I will send rain to the land. I'm about to change everything. Elijah, I'm gonna use you. Can I just tell you, I believe a revival's coming to America. Revival's coming to your neighborhood, your business. But it's gonna take men and women of God like you and me who will just simply say, you know what, if the Lord is God, then God use us any way that you want. If the Lord is God, then everything I got is yours, O Lord. If the Lord is God, then my days are yours, O God. Use us, shine through me, O Lord. And so the Bible says Elijah went to present himself to Ahab. Talk about faith. Talk about boldness and courage. Talk about having a belief in your heart that says, if the Lord is God, I'll do whatever God asks of me. And I want you to know this courage that Elijah moved in was not because of what he saw around him or what he saw inside of him. He knew he wasn't enough. He knew circumstances weren't changing. And here's what I'm trying to tell you. Your courage in situations comes from your confidence in God. When you're in the middle of a situation that's beyond you, that's bigger than you, maybe you're going through a season in your marriage that is really difficult, or maybe you're going through something in your business, or maybe you've been diagnosed with a disease, or whatever you're walking through, a dry season, a drought in your life, I want you to know you can have courage to obey God and to trust God and to continue to worship God, not because you're enough, but because He is enough. Your confidence to face whatever we're facing in our nation or in your life comes from God. And there is just one God. And can I just remind you today that he has an endless supply of power, strength, and presence for you. You know, we live in Houston, so you know this to be true, that sometimes we can walk outside and it's so thick outside, it's like shoving your face in a sweaty armpit, you know? It's just like, it feels like sometimes we open the door, walk outside, and it's like someone punched us in the face. And it's just like, this is awful. So if you're outside working in the garden like I never do, uh, then, then you know that sometimes you just need a drink, right? And so you could be in the garage, you could be dealing with the flowers, you could be outside trying to clean out your garage. If you're outside mowing the grass and you're doing things like that, sometimes you want to drink. And so I'll go in the house sometimes. And you know what? I could be so thirsty, I feel like drinking every bit of water that my house has. But you know what the reality is? I could never drink all the water in my house. You want to know why? Because my refrigerator, my water hose, my sink, my faucet are all hooked up to the water supply in our city. And in other words, I could never drink all that because it's hooked up to an endless supply somewhere else. Here's what I want you to know. I know you're not enough to face what you're facing. I know that we're outnumbered. I know that, man, when you look at situations in your marriage or your family or circumstances, it can feel overwhelming. But I just want you to know you are hooked up to God Almighty. And you are not relegated to your source of power and strength and presence, but you are hooked up to the endless source of presence and power and strength. God is with you, and if you hook up with him, he is unlimited. So that is why Elijah was able to do everything that God asked of him. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna walk through 1 Kings 18, and I want us to just pull out some truths that God would want to drive home in myself and drive home in you today. Is that okay? To, to get us to a point where maybe we believe that the Lord is God and therefore, man, we go all in. And maybe you're here today and you're questioning whether or not the Lord is God. You're like, well, I don't know if I really believe that. My prayer for you is that by the end of this message, that God would reveal himself to you in such a way that you go all in in your faith with the Lord and you realize living for him there is no better way to live. 
So let's dive in if we can. So between verse 3 and 16, what happens is Elijah finds out where Ahab is. There's a, there's a, a, a message sent to King Ahab, and there's a meeting set up between uh, King Ahab and, and Elijah. And remember, King Ahab wants to kill Elijah and all of God's prophets and God's people. So here's where we stumble upon it. The first thing I want to pull out from the Word of God as we walk through the rest of this chapter from verse 17 is this thought right here. What you look to often determines what you walk through. So then my question is, where is your focus? Are you focused on yourself, your own pleasures? Are you focused on God himself and his word? Where is it that you lock yourself in? A better question is what have you elevated above the importance and priority of God? That's the reason the first commandment in Exodus, the first commandment that the Lord actually gave us was that there would be no other gods before us. In other words, here's what the Lord was saying with this commandment. I want you to lock your eyes on me and my word. And if you'll do that, that's why Matthew 6, 33 says, seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, and everything else is going to be okay. In other words, what you focus your eyes to often determines what you are walking through. And it's important for us to sometimes step back, assess our life, and ask ourselves, if we believe that the Lord is God, then why wouldn't I put him first above everything else in my life? Why wouldn't I put him first over my Monday through my Saturday? If I believe that the Lord is God, why wouldn't I trust him with my finances? Why wouldn't I trust him with my relationships? Why wouldn't I trust him with my future? If the Lord is God, then he will be first, my number one priority. So I want you to see this because in 1 Kings 18, verse 17, this meeting between the evil King Ahab and Elijah takes place. Look at what the Bible says in verse 17. The Bible says that when Ahab saw Elijah, he said to him, is that you, troubler of Israel? In other words, Ahab was blaming the drought on God's man, on the men of God. He was blaming it on God's people. He was blaming the drought and the suffering season on Elijah. Here's Elijah's response to Ahab. I have not made trouble for Israel. In other words, it's not me. The reason there's so much destruction and sin in your land, the reason there's drought and disease, it has nothing to do with me, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. In other words, you're the one causing this. Now watch. You have abandoned the Lord's commands Your eyes are no longer on the Lord. Your eyes are no longer obeying God's word. Look at this. You have abandoned the Lord's command and have followed. Now your eyes are fixed on the Baals, these false gods, these false things that we put above the Lord. And so let me just be really clear because what you've got to realize is our choices, the things that we elevate above God can sometimes cause uh, rough seasons in our lives. And this is what Elijah is telling King Ahab. Now, I want to be really clear. That does not mean any bad season you go through, it's because of sin in your life. That is not true, and that is not godly. It is definitely not biblical. Sometimes we just live in a broken world, and, and stuff happens. Sometimes there are other people that are evil that sometimes they cause pain. It has nothing to do with their sin in your life. If you're walking through a tough time today, I am not saying that it is because of sin. But what I am saying is, Sometimes it could be. Just because it's not true all the time doesn't mean it's not true some of the time. And the principle that Elijah is driving home to King Ahab is this thought right here. What you're fixing your eyes to is where, what determines what you walk through. If you fix your eyes on God, his word, and his promises, you reap God's blessings and God's presence. If you don't and you follow the Baals, other things that we lift up, listen, those things are empty and are not hooked up to endless joy and pleasure and peace. So what is it that you're focused on? That's the reason John 16 verse 33 actually tells us that in this world you will have trouble. So we're going to have trouble whether we fix our eyes on God, but I'm just here to tell you it determines on the blessings of God being poured out in your life in the midst of the trouble. And what Elijah was telling King Ahab is, look, I didn't cause this drought. And I'm telling you, here's what he's saying. If you believe the Lord is God, then why wouldn't you fix your eyes solely on him? So my question today is this. Where is it that you've taken your eyes off God and you've put it on something else that you're chasing? 
Where is it you changed your priorities and you began chasing a relationship more than you're chasing God? What is it that you've elevated above what God wants to do in your life? Because whatever you look at, it determines what you drift towards. As a church, as men and women of God, especially in a day, in an age that we live in in our culture, man, let's be a church. Let's be men and women who fix our eyes on God's word and fix our eyes on God's presence, right? Because what you fix your eyes on, you drift towards. Now, I don't know how many parents are in here that had to teach their kids to drive. Anybody? Yeah, okay, that's like the worst thing on earth. It's like God's punishment to us from when we were teenagers. That's what that is. Because you get it, I had, to, I had to teach my girls to drive. Now, they're great drivers now. The key word in that sentence is now. They are great drivers now, but it wasn't like that. The first time we get behind, I let one of them get behind the wheel, not in a parking lot that I control, but on a street where there's other cars. That is the worst punishment that you will ever have in your life. That is awful. You get in there and they're weaving, they think lanes on the road are suggestions. You know what I'm saying? Like, you ever, you, ever, you ever driven with a bad driver? Anybody ever driven with a bad driver? It's unnerving because they're looking everywhere. Like, I would be trying to tell them directions, and I'd be like, hey, hey, here's what you're going to want to do. Uh, like, if you notice, like, what could happen here? Like, look at all the scenarios. And here's them driving, and they would look over at me to answer me. I'm like, we don't need your eyes. I only need your mouth right now. I don't need you to look at me to answer me. Right? And then they're so busy looking at other things, they'd run right up to a red light where cars are stopped. I won't tell you which daughter did this all the time, but her name rhymes with Borden. So you figure it out for yourself. I'm not running over her. And like she would just, and I'm like, what are you looking at? You know? Because what you look at, you drift to. You look to the left, you're driving to the left. You look to the right, that's the reason in your vehicle you've got a massive front windshield and really small side view mirrors because the majority of your life needs to be fixed straight ahead on what God is leading you to, not on the distractions around you. And so while I'm teaching my girls to drive, I had to drill this inside of them and drill this inside of them. Hey, hey, keep your eyes ahead, keep your eyes ahead. Don't, don't get distracted. First thing you do, stick that phone in a glove box and shut it. I don't want you looking at that thing at all. Don't look at your phone, don't look left, don't look right. Man, you look straight ahead. In other words, what I think the, that Elijah is saying is, hey, King Ahab, you took your eyes off of what's ahead. You took your eyes off of God, you started looking at your phone, Ahab. You started looking at all the other things, Ahab. You start looking at your DMs and responding, Ahab. Man, you started looking at everything that everyone's talking about Ahab and look I didn't cause this you're drifting the nation where you're actually focusing your eyes so Ahab says look if you believe the Lord is God then fix your eyes on him and the reality is man we don't worship Baal or Asherah the gods that they're dealing with I mean most of us don't even know what that is but anything we lift above God and put on the throne of our lives as most important becomes a false idol. And too many times we look to things that are socially acceptable and we start chasing things that are good and important. There's nothing wrong with them, but anything good or important that we place above God in priority, then it becomes an idol that can lead us astray. And the reality is, is that anything we look to as our source of joy, pleasure, security, it becomes our idol. Did you know this? That it's entirely possible to have God as a resource to your life and not have God as the source of your life. See, too many times what happens is we put God in a resource category slot called 11 a.m. on Sunday morning. And it becomes a resource we turn to, but we're living for other sources the rest of the week. Can I just tell you, God never intended to be a resource for you. He intended to be the source for you. Because other things that we pull and place in first place of our lives, listen, it's so important to get this. They promise things they can't fulfill. They promise peace and joy. They promise fulfillment. And some of us are struggling to find purpose. And can I just tell you, it only happens when God becomes first. 
False gods promise what only the one true God provides. Listen, here's what Elijah's challenge would be for us. I mean, you want to see victory in your life? That if you believe the Lord is God, focus on him and his word. Second thing we find in this interaction between this evil king Ahab and Elijah, who believed the Lord was God, secondly is this right here. It's not enough to know the truth. You have to live the truth. Come on. It's not enough to know the truth. It's about living the truth. And if the Lord is God, then we say, you know what? As for me and my house, we ain't going to live our way. We're going to live his way. And as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And if I truly believe that the Lord is God, then I make a choice that says it doesn't matter what emotions and desires I have. I want to live according to God's word. I'm going to build my business on his word. I'm going to build my life on his word. I'm going to build my future on his word. And what we do is we say, hey, look, it's not enough to know that the Lord is God. Man, I want to, if I believe the Lord is God, then it changes how I behave Monday through Saturday. You know, when Rachel and I first got married, it was like uh, 1903, something like that. Uh, and so, like, there wasn't a whole lot of restaurants around. There wasn't, like, there wasn't, like, places you could go hang out. Chicken and pickle didn't exist. You know, they didn't have big gyms. Like, like you ain't got, I mean, like, it was just different. So, you know what we did? We would go to the mall. Now, half of it was because we would just want to go to the mall and walk around and do something and look. And the other half was that she loves to window shop. I don't want to window shop. I don't want anything to do with window shopping. Like she wants to go in different stores and hold things up and look at it and go, what do you think about this? And I'd be like, baby, baby, that looks beautiful. She goes, really? Do you think it looks great? And I'd be like, baby, not only does it look great, you look great. And she'd be holding that shirt up and she goes, but, but does it look good on me? How do I look? I say, baby, you look like a rail. Skinny, like a rail in that. Let's buy that mess. And she'd be like, yeah, I think so too. I think it's perfect. I say, yes, let's go buy it. You know what she does? She walks somewhere at a different part of the store, hangs it up and hides it just in case she ever wants to come back. Somebody else hadn't bought it already. <laughs> then we go do it 50 other times at 50 other stores. And then we end up leaving five and a half hours later from the mall and we didn't buy one thing. <laughs> I don't want a window shop. I want a bye-bye. I wish Dillard's and Macy's had a drive through window so I could just pull my car right up to it, tap on the glass, and say, give me some jeans. Sir, yes, sir, what size? Doesn't matter. I got duct tape and rope at home. I'll make it work. Like, I don't want to go in a window shop. I want to own. Can I tell you that some of us are really good at window shopping our faith? You've been window shopping, window shopping, window shopping. It's time to go to the counter and say, God, I believe that you are God. And that means I'm going to live for you every day of my life. <laughs> Quit window shopping and let's own the faith. It's like when we were younger, you know, we used to go to the uh, skating rink um, and you, they had this song, Hokey Pokey. Y'all remember the Hokey Pokey? I don't know if y'all remember. It said something like this. I don't remember exactly how it goes. Maybe you can help me. It says, like, put your right hand in. And you shake it all about. You do the hokey pokey and you turn yourself around. That's what it's all up. Yeah, you even got the claps. And then it didn't even stop there. Then it'd go, you put your right foot in, you put your right foot out. I can't do that, I fall over. And then you do the hokey pokey and you turn yourself around. Can I just tell you, too many of us think that that's the way we live our faith out. We put our life in on Sunday morning and then pull our life out on Monday through Saturday. We're hokey pokey Christians. And what this world needs, if you want to see a victory in our culture and in our nation, is not living out the hokey pokey, but living out our faith in such a way that we say we believe the Lord is God. So we're going all in on this thing. And I want you to know God wants all of you. He does. Not just part of you. So watch what Elijah says to King Ahab. Watch this. This is crazy because Elijah actually talks to King Ahab in the scriptures. Man, hold on. This thing's mess. Oh, there it is. It's delayed. 1 Kings 18, 19 says this. Now some of the people, this is the way Elijah is talking to King Ahab. Some of the people all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel. He wants to have a showdown on Mount Carmel with all the false prophets. Watch this. And bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah, so there's 850 of them, who eat at Jezebel's table. 
So Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people. So there's all these 850 prophets of Baal and Asherah, and Elijah's by himself. It's 850 to one. And now he's sitting there, and Elijah has a message to the nation of Israel and to these false prophets. You ready? Listen to this. How long will you waver between two opinions? You know what he's saying? How long are you going to window shop? How long? How long are you going to window shop? Come on, own this thing. Don't window shop your faith. How long are you going to waver between Baal and Asherah and God? If you believe the Lord is God, then live for him. And then he says the exact thing we've been talking about all message. If the Lord is God, there it is, if then, if then, if X equal five, right? Come on. If there's a hurricane coming, if always determines then. If the Lord is God, then follow him. And he's telling the nation, look, what are you doing? If you're saying the Lord is God, then it should change everything else about how you live. Follow him. But then he goes, but if Baal is God, then why are you wavering between these two things? Follow him. And the people said nothing as they listened to this message. Elijah was saying, quit window shopping. What Elijah was saying is, listen, Israel, man, if you're going to live for possessions, go all in and live for possessions. If you're going to live for, for, for pleasure, then go all in and live for pleasure. Quit wavering between, between what you're doing on Sunday and, 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 and that you're proclaiming Christ on Sunday, but that you're living like he doesn't exist on Monday. And what Elijah's saying to him is this, man, if you're going to live for your image, then, then build your brand, man. Quit, quit wavering between the two. And what Elijah's saying to the people of Israel is, listen, 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 quit worshiping God on Sunday. This is Elijah to, the Israel, to Israel. I would never say this to you. Uh, but but it, quit worshiping on Sunday and hugging idols on Monday. Quit worshiping on Sunday and chasing after idols Friday night. What is it? You're placing your pleasure, your temptations, your lust, your desires. What is it you're placing above God? Elijah is saying, if the Lord is God and you believe that, then come on, let's follow him. In other words, what he's saying is if he is not Lord of all, then he is not Lord at all. Where is it you haven't made him, made him Lord of all? The third thing I want to pull out real quick is in the, of the scripture and the passage that we're actually studying is I want you to see the next few verses in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 24. Uh, this is the principle that we find. When the odds are against you, remember God is still with you. Come on, somebody. Now, what I hope you noticed in verse 21 is there were 850 false prophets and people of, of Israel that came forth on top of Mount Carmel with Elijah. And here in this moment, what he, what he saw was he gathers the 450 prophets of Baal, gathers the 400 prophets of Asherah, and now there's a showdown happening. And there's this, he's up against a powerful, out, he's outnumbered 850 to 1. And I want you to see the belief and the faith and the courage of Elijah. It doesn't matter what the circumstances around him says he knows in his heart that he believes the Lord is God and if he believes the Lord is God it doesn't matter what's happening around him in his nation he knows that God's going to come through because God's presence is what brings about change first Corinthians Kings 18 24 this is what this is what happens as the scripture tells us then you call on the name of your God Elijah said and I'll call on the name of the Lord you call on your God. I'm gonna call on the name of the Lord, the God who answers by fire and burns up the altar and the sacrifice. He is God. Then all the people there, uh, people said, what you say is good. See, Elijah had faith. He had faith that God was his God and that the Lord was God and he would show up because God was with him. So what they did was they grabbed two bulls two altars, they had a bull and an altar there, a bull and an altar there, and they said, we're gonna pray, and whatever God answers and burns up the bull on the altar, that's the real God. And Elijah did not worry at all. He was like, okay, man, if Baal's your God, then follow him. Quit wavering, let's have a little showdown right now. And so he begins to do this, and the reason Elijah had faith is because Elijah was not looking at the circumstances around him or his ability inside of him. Because listen to me, and this is huge, faith is not found in what you are believing for. 
Because I don't know about you, but there's gonna be things that you're believing for that are impossible. Some of you are believing for a healing. You're believing for your husband to come back to Jesus. You're believing for your marriage to be restored. You're believing that you're gonna find a job. You're believing for a healing in your body as you've been diagnosed with a disease. I'm just here to tell you, faith is not found in what you are believing for. Faith is found in who you are believing in. You have to believe in God. All these false prophets and and I started praying to Baal and Asherah. Elijah prays to God and the reality is this right here, that man, they were praying to somebody that could do nothing. Elijah was praying to someone who literally can do everything. And so what happens is they begin to pray and I want you to see this in verse 26. So they, meaning the, uh, they took the bull gave them and prepared it. They called on the name of Baal. This is the 850 uh, false prophets. In the morning till noon, so they spent most of the day praying and they shouted, but there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around after they had made, uh, after the altar that they had made. So they danced around this altar. Man, they started jumping, shouting, praying, Baal, send fire, Baal, show us, Baal, come through for us. And man, the reality is, is that if Elijah could go before King Ahab who was trying to kill him, and if Elijah could actually face off with 850 and, and, a, and a group of, from the nation on top of Mount Carmel, knowing that he was alone, can I just tell you, whatever you're facing, you can do so with confidence and faith that God is with you. He has not abandoned you. He wants you to find victory today, and he is on your side. Whatever miracle you need, God is with you. The miracle may be bigger than you, The miracle may be way bigger than what you can do, but the reality is the miracle is not bigger than God. God is with you. Several years ago, the girls were super young. Uh, At this time, we went to the hospital to see see Rachel's dad, who uh, was in the hospital, was very serious, and and just a few months later would pass away. And we went to the hospital, and uh, when we were in there visiting her dad, uh, we came out to the parking lot, a parking garage in the hospital and our car had gotten broken into. They had smashed the window and stolen a really expensive camera out of the car. The girls were really small, but they were very upset. Rachel was mad. I was mad, and we get in the car, and the girls were upset. We're cleaning glass off the seats, and, and they had stolen this camera. Uh, and, and so we were a little frustrated, and the girls were like, how in the world does someone break glass? I mean, it's glass. Like, glass is the most impenetrable substance known to man. They're like, it's glass. How do they break it? And so I'm just, like, driving, half listening, and Jordan's like, man, I, I don't know how anybody broke glass to get in. And Avery looked at Jordan and he goes, Jordan, it's not that hard to break glass. You need one of two things. You need a really sharp knife or a stick of dynamite. <laughs> That's it. So later that night, I was praying over them, putting them to bed. And uh, their beds like sat right under a window in their bedroom. And so they were there and I prayed over them and I left and I could hear their fear about the window. They kept asking about the window. Is it going to be okay sleeping under this window? And so I went out, outside and I, I listened to, to them as they began to talk about this. And they were saying, well, uh, what if someone breaks the glass? What if they have a stick of dynamite and they break this glass and they come in and steal us? What are we going to do? And they talked about it. And I was about to go back in there and just assure them. And before I did, Avery said to Jordan, now, we don't really have anything to worry about. We can go to sleep. And Jordan said, why? He said, well, dad's right outside. He's here with us. I just think some of us today, we're living our lives out of fear, and we've forgotten that God is with us. His presence is with us. I know what you're facing is scary. And I know you got a report from the doctor that is unnerving. And I realize you and your spouse have been fighting I know you've been without a job for six months, but I'm just here to tell you that if you really believe that the Lord is God, then we face those situations different than those who do not have hope. You and I have hope, and the Lord is on your side. Even when you are outnumbered, when the odds are against you, I want you to remember God is with you. Because the reality is this right here. You plus God always equals the majority. 
You plus God always equals the majority. God is on your side no matter what. Stack everything else on this side. If you and God are here, this happens. So Elijah is facing off with these prophets who are praying. And I want you to see Elijah's response. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them, shouting louder. He's already celebrating like he already won. And he's telling them, surely he is God. Perhaps he is in deep thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he's sleeping and must be awakened. In other words, Elijah's going, I ain't even worried about this. There is no fear or worry anymore. Why? And this is the reality. You celebrate in the middle of a battle if you're confident that there's a victory at the end of the battle. Some of you need to learn to celebrate the goodness of God, the characteristics of God, the personality of God in the middle of your struggle. Some of you need to turn on some worship music and begin to worship the Lord when you look around and don't see anything else to worship. You need to start celebrating in the middle of your dry seasons, in the middle of your drought, in the middle of your battles, knowing that God is on your side. Last, real quick, the last thing I want you to see, and this is huge, is that when you stand fully for God, God shows up fully for you. I'm here to tell you, if you will take a stand for God, God's gonna show up in your business, in your marriage. If you will begin to take things to him, stand up for him, let him shine. If you believe that the Lord is God, then take a stand and do what he's asking you to do. What is it that God's asking you to step into? What is it that God's asking you to change, to begin to live for? Come on, begin to move and go right in with what God is asking. Because here are these 850 prophets, they shouted louder. As a matter of fact, verses 28 to 35, they just shout louder, they dance, they start cutting themselves, it got crazy. And they start praying to Baal and nothing. In other words, here's what I want you to know. Everybody on Mount Carmel, everybody, thousands of people on Mount Carmel, 850 false prophets, people from the nation, everybody on Mount Carmel was shouting and living for Baal. There was only one living for the Lord our God. And here's what I want to remind you. Right is right, even if everyone is against it. Wrong is wrong, even if everyone is for it. Quit looking at the crowd to determine your direction. Come on, we look to God's word. Even if you're all alone, let's go all in. So Elijah prepared the altar. And here's what Elijah does. He had such faith that the Lord was God. He goes, I want you to bring four buckets, of big old, big old bucket jars full of water. Pour it on the bull. So the and then he did this three times. So there's 12 large vats of water that he poured on the bull and the altar. And then the trench, the Bible says, was full of water. And then all of a sudden, here's what it was. And I want you to see this as the band comes in verse 36 and verse 37 of 1 Kings 18. At the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward. Stop right here. I want you to notice that he took a step. What is it God's asking you to do? Some of you need to take a step today and trust him. You need to step out in obedience and trust God with the tithe. You need to step out in obedience and get involved and start serving on a team. Some of you need to step out and trust God. Change what you do and what you live for on the weekend. Some of you need to change what you're chasing. You need to take a step towards God. Some of you just need to step forward in your worship and begin to worship God, even though you fully don't understand it, but you know he's deserving. Some of you need to take a step. Elijah took a step forward and prayed Watch this, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Watch what he says. Let it be known today that you are God in Israel. Notice he didn't say, when you burn up this bull, can you go ahead and burn up all these prophets? Can you go ahead and burn up all these people of Baal and Asherah? Can you go ahead and burn up most of the nation of Israel? They already turned their back on you. Notice he wasn't trying to do any of that. That isn't godly. That's not what the word of God is. You know what a heart of God is? It says, man, I'm gonna pray that people's hearts turn back to God. You know what this nation needs? It needs a church. It needs a man of God and a woman of God to pray that our hearts get turned back to God. You know what we need to do? Is not start fighting for the election that's coming up in a month and a half, but how about we just start interceding and praying for a nation to find God, not a candidate. Then he says, I pray that they would know you today that you are the God of Israel. That you have done all these things, that I've done all these things at your command. Answer me, O oh Lord, answer me. Watch this. Here's why I want you to answer me. So that these people will know that you, O oh Lord, are God. And that you are turning their hearts back again. Some of you that are praying for a miracle in your family, in your finances, and in this nation, you need to realize that God does miracles 
for a lot of reasons, because he's for you, not against you, number one, but also because it's a sign and it's a testimony. It's the light. Matthew 5 says your life is a light to the world. People need to see Jesus inside of you. And I'm just here to tell you, here in this moment, Elijah was saying, reveal yourself so that a nation can turn back to you. If you believe the Lord is God, then take the step that God's asking you to take. Whatever battle you're facing, believe God to come through. Here's what happens in verse 38 and 39. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the bull, the wood, the altar, the stones, the altar, and the soil, the ground around it, and it licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, watch how a nation turned back to God because there was one man who said, I just believe the Lord is God, and that means I'm gonna trust him. I'm gonna obey him. I'm gonna live for him. I just believe the Lord is God. I'm not living my way. I'm living his way. Watch what happens. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Can I just tell you right now that your victory is on the other side of your obedience? What is God asking you to do? As a church, let's live in obedience to the Lord. There is a nation that needs to say he is God, that needs revival, that needs to turn back to God. But it takes men and women like you and me. It takes a church like us that says we just believe. We believe, we believe that the Lord is God. And if this, then that. If the Lord is God and I truly believe it, it changes my Monday through Saturday. If the Lord is God and I truly believe it, it changes changes what I live for. If the Lord is God, then I don't live for pleasure or for lust or for temptation and desire. I live for the holiness of God's word. And if the Lord is God, and I believe that, then as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord.